You all have seen Nancy's book. She's an amazing, amazing professor. I loved her in the classroom. Um, I hope many of you did get into some of her book. We will have plenty of time for Q&A after Nancy does her prepared remarks. And with that, Dr. Nancy Kane. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Willie. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, he was shy and retiring as a student, never said a word, as you can imagine. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to pick up at Willie's moment just a few minutes ago when he was looking at these extraordinary pictures of his family and talking about last year. So he, ta he called me because he'd read, he'd read Fortune in Crisis. He called me this spring and said, I want you to come to the conference. I hadn't heard from Willie in, I don't know, we hadn't spoken in eight or nine years, um, although we know lots and lots of people in common and we've, we kept in touch that way. And um, he told me about the speech and he told me about this amazing crucible he'd been through with himself um, in relation to his relationship with his partners and his kids. And I was so struck by the emotional awareness he brought to the situation, by how critical this was to him, and not just his family, but his sense of self, his leadership, his company. So my, and again, you see that here today, right? This is a conference of, by the way, I go to a lot of conferences, the energy and the gemütlich feeling in this room and in the, in the meal last night and in the uh, shuttle rides is really, really unique. Um, I'm very impressed by it and heartened by it. But in any event, he opens, the, he ends this, his State of the Union um, and, and offering to you by talking about it. And, and that's where I begin. So my work, I'm a historian, I'm, I get paid to read other people's mail, I teach at the Harvard Business School, I have taught a big course on the history of leadership that begins with Winston Churchill and ends with Mark Zuckerberg, and until we get to the last month of class, we have no guests because they're all dead. <laughs> right? So I am a strange animal. I get paid to look at the big picture. Mark Twain once said, the past doesn't repeat itself precisely, but sometimes it does rhyme. So I am interested, and have been for 25 years at the Harvard Business School, in the rhymes of history and how those rhymes help managers and leaders, because you're both, man all of you are both managers and leaders, make smart decisions, walk into your better self, lead people, help them lead themselves to their, their better selves and their destinies, and move the boulder of positive change and business forward. So that's my job. And over the last 15 years, I have been studying how crises affect leadership. That I, I, I know a great, great deal, because 15 years is a long time. I know a great deal about how you lead in crises. We're going to talk about that. But what I've really been studying is the, is the, the, the fact that crises, turbulence, VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, how these moments... You saw Willie with a few examples of that in your business. You're going to hear from people this week that are, have examples of that from apartments.com to Katera uh, to what's going to happen in the midterms and the election in the large picture of VUCA out there. Right? You all think about that, live through crises, have been in them, have navigated them, but we don't think about crises as, as classrooms, as moments when... When all hope is lost and you don't know what to do, you, and therefore the people that look to you, because all eyes are on you, even though you don't know it, lots and lots of eyes are on you. When the people that look to you have a chance to be impacted by your moving into a stronger, more resilient, more courageous, more supple, more dedicated and determined version of yourself. So that's what I do. So what Willie is describing today is part of that process for himself and, and, and the impact, the ripple of impact that it's having. Well, I'm going to talk about two stories of people, Ernest Shackleton and the Antarctic explorer that almost everyone in this room knows of, and Abraham Lincoln, who everyone in this room knows of. I'm going to tell you some things I think you, I hope you have not, you don't know. But the, these two come out of a book I've just finished, which you've seen. Forged in Crisis, The Power of Courageous Leadership in Turbulent Times. And it's a storybook. There are no PowerPoints. There are no pull boxes. There are no bullet points. It is a storybook of how each of these people starts down on their knees howling at the universe because they have no idea what they're going to do. And how in that moment and in the ensuing moments, they discover their muscles of courage, 
their muscles of seriousness, their muscles of resilience, their muscles of compassion and caring and energy by virtue of the fact that they realize they're responsible to others. Our responsibility to others turns out to be an extraordinary gas tank for getting our own selves up and on to the higher road again. So this is a story of how leaders are made better, stronger, braver into, into versions of themselves that is their destiny in the midst of crises. So I'm going to walk you through a couple of those stories. I hope this talk, of all the things I hope of this talk, I hope it will be an appetizer for you to open that book at any of the stories. There are three more amazing stories, which aren't amazing because of anything Nancy Kane did, but they are amazing because these are lives of individuals that were bravely led. Messy, brave, full of our, you know, our, our, the humanity that defines us all, nothing neat and clean and Hollywood about them, except that they make the impossible possible as they themselves are made better. So that's the appetizer. I want to give you two last little bits of sherbet before we go on to the main course. The first one is that leaders are made, not born. They're made. And the best definition of that making, I'm stealing from A.G. Laffley, who I once interviewed when I went around with the Harvard Business School media team and made a movie on what executives from all kinds of industries learn from Lincoln about leadership. Turns out everyone has a relationship with Lincoln. You just ask them. And here's what Laffley said about the making of leaders. He said, leaders are made, great leaders are made from three ingredients. The first one is a combination of nature and nurture, right? The endowments, the stuff we come in with, the strengths, the weaknesses, married to nurture. The experiences and, and knowledge we, and understanding we gain as we chalk up mileage on the odometer of life. So the first ingredient is both nature and nurture. The second ingredient is a moment arises that the individual recognizes demands his or her leadership. A moment arises. So part of what Willie is talking about in these amazing slides and then, and then his integrated call to action for you drawing off those slides is has a moment arise, whether it's the guy with the, with the buffalo or the water, the bison, or it's, or it's you know, the shark charting the course or it's the hawk grabbing at the rabbit or the groundhog, has a moment arisen that you understand demands your leadership. And notice, my friends, that that is premised on something very, very important. It goes back to what Willie's ground rules at the beginning are. That, that, that making ingredient is premised on the idea that we are spending, you are spending as leaders and managers, some of your time looking up and out. Right? So I ride horses. I don't. Climb mountains. I, I'm, I'm a little bit younger than Strauss, but I don't have a prayer of looking like the analog of Strauss. I, I, don't, I have never summited anything higher than like Ben Nevis in Scotland. I feel slothful, actually, to be honest, being at this conference. <laughs> right? I felt slothful. Just to be in the orbit of many of the astounding athletes and leaders in this room is to feel slothful. But when you ride a horse, as when you bike, you actually want to ride from your core. Right? You're like this. And if you look down as you jump, you actually make you and your horse much, much less safe, much more precarious. So the idea that the second ingredient is, is a moment that we know demands our leadership means we have to be looking up and out. So I worry a great deal, Mr. Willie, that we're spending so much time stroking our lovers, right? Our PDA better halves, right? And I worry so much that we're missing all kinds of stuff, right? From, from the, the, the new possibility, the whale coming up out of the water, to the folks eating our lunch, to what in the hell is happening to our kids' role models. So second ingredient, a moment arises that, that the individual recognizes demands your leadership, premised on you seeing the big picture. But the third ingredient, just as important as the first two, is that each of you as individuals has to embrace the cause and get in the game. So that's about your relationship with yourself. I see it. I'm in, I'm going forward, and I'm all in. So three ingredients, last, last appetizer, last dollop of sherbet. Courageous leaders, effective leaders, great leaders, audacious leaders. The term, the term is way overused, and particularly in election years, it gets to seem, in some contexts, oxymoronic. Let me give you a good definition. I like it. 
you'll decide whether it's useful to you. It's in the early pages of the book, and it's from an American writer named David Foster Wallace, who was not a politician or a leadership expert in any way, but a very interesting observer of the larger scene. And he wrote this in an essay he wrote long ago when he was following John McCain around on his first presidential campaign. Courageous leaders are individuals who help us overcome the limitations of our own weaknesses and laziness and selfishness and fears and get us to do harder, better things than we can get ourselves to do on our own. Think about that for a second. Courageous leaders are individuals who help us overcome the boundaries, the barriers of our own weak limitations, weaknesses, selfishness, laziness, fears, and get us to do harder, better things than we can get ourselves to do on our own. That is the story, my friends, of Ernest Shackleton and, this, and making the impossible possible. What he helped his men believe they could do by overcoming their fears. That is the story of Abraham Lincoln leading the nation on to, what will he say? You know, here's your old business, here's your new business. Lincoln took America here, in the, split, in, split in two by a civil war, and said, we are going to a new America, right? a new nation founded and, and living to its promise of all men being created equal. And he made Americans believe that they could do that and that they would fight and die for that. So this definition is a really interesting one. Let me tell you, there are so many people looking at you and looking to you for that kind of credible inspiration and leadership. Okay, let me tell you quickly, I'm gonna just offer you a few snapshots again in the hopes that you'll take a look at the book. Um, and I'll tell you just a, the outlines of the story interspersed with what we can learn from these people. So this is Ernest Shackleton, most of you have heard of him. He was an Antarctic explorer who in 1914 had headed to the South Pole twice, trying to discover it, trying to be the first man to get to the point furthest south on Earth and it failed. And indeed, I was talking to Ed. I think it's Ed the Summiter. Ed? Ed Easter's, Ed Easter's amazing. Just his energy. Again, I felt a little weak and shabby. But he's <laughs> genial and extraordinary. Great charisma. I was talking to him. I asked him, are you really scared? And he said, no. he said this. He said, no, because I know how to turn back when I need to. I, said, I actually said, were you scared out of your mind? And he said, no, I've been scared plenty but I knew when to turn back. So Shacklin had done something very interesting on his second expedition. He and three men had got, he and two men had gotten to 90 miles north of the pole, trudging from the, from the uh, Australian side of the continent, and they, he knew they could make it to the pole. He didn't think they had enough food and physical strength to get back. And so he turned back less than 100 miles from the pole, knowing that he wouldn't get back in time to be the first to discover it, but also knowing that, he, that if he proceeded on, they would probably die on the way back. As he said to his wife, better a, de a, a live donkey than a dead lion. So this is an interesting, smart, serious, and narcissistic driven man who in 1914 says, I'm going to do something different with Antarctica. It had already been discovered in the intervening years between his second expedition and the third that he was planning by a Norwegian named Roald Amundsen in an extraordinary feat of polar ex, uh, exploration uh, and adventuring. Uh, and, if, and there's a great book written about it for all the really serious adventurers in this room called The Last Place on Earth by Roland Huntford. In any event, Ro Huntford discovers the pole. One of Shackleton's, ne in, 19, in 1911, one of Shackleton's nemesis is, is killed on the way home trying to discover the pole for Britain. And Shackleton gets his dander up in 1912 and says, I got to do something big and bold. I'll walk across the pole and we'll be the first group of men to cross the entire continent. And so in 1914, he, he begins, 1913, he begins planning for his expedition. Here was how he recruited people. This is an ad. Men wanted hazardous journey, low wages, bitter cold, long hours of complete darkness, safe return, doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. Just your typical craigslist.com ad. So what's he doing? First lesson, what's Shackleton doing here? And Willie was alluding to this as well in a number of slides. Hire for attitude, train for skill. Hire for attitude, train for skill. So he wanted a, a certain kind of person who, who had transparency about what they were getting into, and he brought those people along and then developed them. So he pulls together the people, the goods, the supplies, 
the dogs, for, to, to, to move the dog sleds, and he's ready to go. By the, by the summer of 1914, he, he and his men sail to South Georgia Island. They're sailing out to, off the coast of South America, southeast, to a whaling station in the North Atlantic, where the whalers say to him, this is December 1914, hold up, Captain Shackleton, there's too much ice and ice flows and bergs far north, you don't want to head south. You need to wait until the warm weather in the southern hemisphere settles in. Shackleton waits 30 days, gets impatient, and heads south anyway. And in January of 1915, ice locks the ship. So by January and February and March and April and May and on and on, month going into month, season into season, the ice has locked his boat. They have no radio. They have no text message. They have no ways. And, and Shackleton has a really interesting problem on his hands, which is how do I, second lesson, how do I, in turbulence when things change or when I need more from my people, how do I manage the en energy of my team? We don't talk at all in leadership HR circles about managing energy. Energy is the critical, defining fuel that holds people together or breaks them apart or motivates them or demotivates them or makes them credibly hopeful or makes them pessimistic. Shackleton spends every single day thinking in small details down to the mo most minute moment with a man. When he saw a man flagging, for example, this is lesson number three, when he saw a man flagging, he would order up hot milk for all the men around him so that Two things, so the, the men's energy would rise, particularly the flagging team member, and so that the man who Shackleton was worried about would not be embarrassed by knowing that the boss was anxious about it. So he would, he would move between the large strategic objective, I, I've got to keep the mission together even though my ship is stuck, to I've got to take care of this man right now because he's flagging. And, and so, the, so Two lessons, manage the energy of your, importance of managing the energy of your team, especially when circumstances are volatile. And second, all great managers and leaders toggle seamlessly between the small and the real and the large and the course. The large mission, the large strategy, the course we're setting. Um, in the summer of 1915, our, our summer, their winter in the sum, su southern hemisphere, the ice begins to crush the wooden endurance, which is the name of the ship. And by, this is August 1915, by September, Shackleton pulls all the men off the ice, I mean off the ship, and puts them in camps in different tents uh, on the ice. He's got 27 men. He's got a lot of canned goods. He has his will, but he has very little else besides three lifeboats to use as resources getting his men home. And his new mission... His new, let me come, go back one. His new mission by the fall of 1915 is I must get my men home alive. He has no idea, by the way, lesson number, insight number four, how he's going to navigate through this darkness, through this wilderness, through this uncertainty. He doesn't know how he's going to do it. The ship goes down through the ice. This is August 1915. The ship goes down through the ice in November. The men are living in tents, to, in carefully planned tent assignments. Let me say a word about that in a second. The men are living in tents. But he isn't, and in November, in eight hours, the ship goes through the ice. The ice closes over. It's November. There's very light in the Antarctic at that time of the year. And there is literally no line on the horizon. And the men are beside themselves. Or most of them were sailors. They'd never been in this kind of situation. You never have your ship disappear. Shackleton himself is anxious beyond belief. That night, that night we know this because the uh, uh, photographer, Frank Hurley, is watching him from his tent. Shackleton just paces the ice. All of you have been here. Maybe not on ice, but you paced, you've laid in your bed and looked up at the ceiling and said, what in the hell am I going to do? And, and he's pacing. And he says later in his diary, I pray to God I can get my men home safely. A man must shape himself to a new mark the moment the old mark goes aground. Now, think about what he's saying there. He's saying, he's talking to himself. He's having a meeting with himself. He's saying, I've got to figure out how I need to get strong enough to shape myself to move toward the new mission, bring them all home alive. I he doesn't know how he's going to do it, he knows, but he knows he must find it in himself because lots of people are looking at him to do that. The next morning, my friends, he gathers, 
he's nervous. He hasn't slept. The next morning, he gathers all the men. He's, he and his, his first mate, Frank Wilde, bring tea to all the men at the tents. He says, get lads, gather ye round, gather round, gather round. So all 27 men gather around him. And he says, ship and store's gone now. We'll go home. So lesson number five, how do you show up in lots of important defining moments? How does the leader show up before people that are looking to you and your body language and your energy and who you're talking to and whether you're studying your lover while they walk by or whether you meet their eye, how do you show up for your team? People later in the diaries, all the men kept diaries so we can reconstruct this story emotionally very clearly. Later in the diaries, men would write, oh, the boss, the boss, we believe the boss is going to get us home. And a lot of that had to do, again, with how Shackleton showed up. So the boat goes down in mid-November. The men are living in tents. They, they're stuck on an iceberg drifting in the Weedle Sea, the southern part of the North, South Atlantic Ocean. And there's really nothing they can do except wait. There's no clear lead to take them in the, in the three lifeboats toward land on the southern uh, on the western, northern side of the Antarctic continent where there's an archipelago of islands. There's no trading ships coming that far south. They will not be discovered. And so it becomes a waiting game. November becomes December. December becomes January. January becomes February. In late January, Shackleton writes these lines in his diary. Put footstep of patience into stirrup of courage. That's all. Then three days later, Wait, wait, wait. The food situation, they're, they're living on pa pa canned goods, penguin, and seal. The food situation, get the fresh meat situation, prophylactic for scurvy, gets very significant. They run low in meat stores at the end of February. Ord Lees, Thomas Ord Lees, the, the supply man, comes to Shackleton and says, we've got to go send the guys out and try and kill, get, get out to the outer reaches of the berg and try and kill some seals. Shackleton says, no, we're not going to do it. We're not going to do it because if I order a whole new fresh killing, the men will think I don't believe we're going to get home soon. I can't take the risk to the morale. I'll trade off the, he's saying, I'll trade off the risk to the, to, to, to the risk to the food supplies in order not to lower morale. And then a week later, the men are so despondent that he actually orders up double rations, low food supplies, for everyone for three days. One of the enlisted men records, double rations today feel full as a tick. Spirits much better. Right, they understand very well at Walker and Dunlop what good food does for all of our moods. But in any event, especially if you go for a 50 mile bike ride afterwards. Uh, but anyway, um, in, in, in late March, the ice breaks and the men sail in the lifeboats for dry land. It's a ter you can read about it in the chapter if you don't know the story. It's an extraordinary journey. The men almost die of dysentery because the water goes bad that they've stored up from a melting ice. And Shackleton is forced to land at an island called South Georgia. It's on the a northwest coast of Antarctica. It, he, they're there a few days before Shackleton realizes no one's going to save us here. Nothing's good. There's not enough food for us to survive very long. I've got to go for help. So he fixes up one of the lifeboats, 24 foot long, James Cairn, puts some boulders in the bottom as ballast, puts canvas over the top as a kind of uh, impromptu deck, builds two masts, and he and six men sail northeast for South Georgia. There's a map in the book so you can see this. And it's 800 miles through some of the world's most difficult, most difficult waters to navigate. Um, and it's an incredibly perilous journey. He, by the way, takes three of his doubting Thomases with him. So Shackleton paid a great deal of attention to his team and its makeup. And he knew that most teams, most organizations, most groups have what, have what we call doubting Thomases, to put it gently, but you know what I'm talking about. The folks that always are saying no. The folks that come to your office all the time to tell you why this can't possibly work, why the sky is falling, why all hope is lost at all times. Shackleton put a great deal of time and attention into managing those doubting Thomases so that they didn't contaminate the energy of any, everyone else, including tent assignments. He put all the doubting Thomases, all the naysayers, all those people that didn't want to change or make good happen in his tent because he understood that keeping your friends close but your enemies closer is really important 
when you're dealing with a turbulent situation. Or as Lyndon Johnson once said in that poetry for which we all know him, better to have him inside the tent peeing out than outside the tent peeing in. <laughs> and so Shackleton, same, same exact idea, takes the three of the doubting Thomases, they won't contaminate the 21, 22 men left, and he and six and five men sail for help. And they eventually reach South Georgia. It's an extraordinary story. It's better than the best Jurassic Park screenplay. It's an extraordinary story. And, and you'll read about it. And it, it has huge amounts to do with, again, with Shackleton's ability to help others get through their limitations of their weaknesses and selfishness and do harder, better things. They arrive at South Georgia in April 1916. They've been basically you know, given up for lost for almost two, a year and a half. And then Shackleton tries to get a boat to get back 800 miles south, now southwest um, to Elephant Island where 22 of his men and his first mate are staying. It takes him four different boats. The first three come close to getting trapped in icebergs heading back and he has to turn back. Shackleton goes gray in the interim, waiting, worrying, anxious, trying to get to his men. And then in August, late August, 1916, he gets a tugboat from uh, the Chilean government in, in, in Puntos Reos. Jeff was telling me about the inside story, so ask him about it. He'll tell you about it. He, uh, he was talking about it last night. Um, and and he, gets, he gets to South Georgia, and he stands on the deck, and he counts as all the men rush out of the overturned lifeboat where they've been living in a shelter, and he counts, and he realizes he's got 22 men. And, there is, and, and, and Tom Crean and, Al, uh, and Frank Worsley, who were with him, who'd stayed with him the whole time and gone across the ocean to South Georgia, said the years just fell from his face. He looked so relieved. And, you know, and, he, and, and, and he had saved all his men. He then, they get all the men back to England, where this First World War is still raging. And tragically, in a script that Shakespeare himself could hardly have written better for tragedy, two of the men are, who have survived all this are immediately killed in machine gun fire in Flanders. Shackleton spends the next three years, no one cares about Antarctic exploration. The carnage of World War I has wiped out the idea of individual heroism. So he fades completely into the mists. He spends two and a half years on the speaker's circuit, mostly in the United States, trying to pay off the debts of his expedition. Go, has, sells off the publication rights to South, uh, 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 an account of the journey so he can pay off the debts. And then in 1920, he gets the urge to go to the ice again. I guess because it had been such a great time this last time, we should go again. And so in, in, in the fall of 1920, he sends out the call, stay with me, to all the living mem crew members, all, all of them but two are living, and 12 of those crew members answer the call and come back. So they, some of them, come, one, two of them comes from Russia, one comes from Japan, one comes from Africa, and the rest come from Europe. And they all come to join Shackleton in one more expedition aboard a boat called the Quest. That boat sets sail in January of 1921. It gets back to South Georgia, the whaling station where so much had happened the last expedition, and Shackleton in Janu late January has a massive heart attack and dies in his cabin at South Georgia. His men bury him there, he's still buried there. And they then proceed to go back to the places they'd been in the endurance expedition, reliving the feat and the, and the camaraderie, the esprit de corps that they'd known there. And, and then the story ends. And no one really remembers Shackleton, and he fades into the mists, and other explorers come to take his place in the English lexicon and, and in the storytelling of generations until about 1980 when a host of books and interest in Shackleton bubbles up and keeps on going and keeps on going and keeps on going. And now there are Shackleton clubs, <laughs> there are Shackleton schools. Shackleton is like this extraordinary underground railroad of people interested in the spirit and the leadership of this man who failed at everything he did except this one extraordinary triumph in which he made himself capable of doing such an extraordinary thing, an ordinary person who mostly failed and then made himself capable of doing an extraordinary thing. Last point, and I'll, spend, I'll tell you a few more slices on Lincoln. In 1930, 1933, the BBC went, that, went around and decided 
to interview all the surviving members of the Endurance Expedition. There were a whole bunch still alive. And the radio interview, you can Google them and listen to these. And to a man, each of the crew members said, when they asked, how did you survive? Each of them said, the boss made us believe we could do it. So you are Shackleton. You have the capacity to unleash in people will and resilience and compassion and cohesion among their fellow people that they do not believe is possible in themselves until you unlock the door. And that's really the story of Ernest Shackleton and the ability of himself to manage himself and lead himself to higher and higher places, stronger and stronger places. Okay, let me say, let me spend some time with Lincoln. I want to leave time for questions. So he's better known to all of us, but I want to tell you some things about Lincoln I believe that you don't know. Um, I spent 15 years with Mr. Lincoln. I know him. I never called him anything but Mr. Lincoln. Um, I, there was a time in my life when He's so well studied that there's a series of books, four books, called A Day in the Life of Lincoln that charts what he did every single day of his life for 56 years and two months. So it was a time when I knew part of his life so well I could have told you, at least in a given month, what he was doing. And I thought for many years I would write a book about Abraham Lincoln. And then, in a welcome and blinding flash of humility, I realized that the world did not need another book about Abraham Lincoln. So I set out, and it's the longest story in the book, divided into very small chapters, because we all have attention deficit disorder. And my editor said, make them short, Nancy, so people can click them, check them off. Very good suggestion. I, what I've tried to do in this chapter is something quite different. I'm trying to tell the story of how Lincoln made himself more emotionally aware, more resilient, more deft, more empathic, because it turns out empathy, is an, as many of you that are skilled negotiators know, is an extraordinary leadership asset, both with your team and with your enemies and with people that are in the middle. How he made himself more empathic, how he made himself more and more morally serious. So Lincoln did not start out, my friends. He was not sprung from the rib of Zeus as the man that we look at in the Lincoln Memorial and think, that's a great leader. He made himself into a great leader. And he failed so many more times than he succeeded. He failed in love. He failed in business twice. He was a terrible retailer. He ran up a huge debt running, going bankrupt in two interesting business ventures. He, he didn't fail so much in law, but I want to say one more thing about that before we finish. But he failed in almost all the political offices he ran for. And he suffered great personal disappointments. He and his wife lost two children, before their son, each son, before they were the age of 10. They lost their first son in Springfield in 1852, Edward Baker Lincoln, and then they lost Tad, Willie Lincoln, I'm sorry, lost Willie Lincoln in 1862. So he made himself into someone that was so important and so right for the moment. Okay, let me say a little bit about that making and tell you a few things I think he can teach us today that are different than what we've heard before about the many skilled and articulate people that have written about Mr. Lincoln. So first of all, I love this portrait because he looks handsome. Um, this is my indulgence. Just forgive me. I'm going into a sidebar that you can just forget. <laughs> so first of all, he looks handsome. Secondly, you can see his great, great thoughtfulness. I mean, this was someone who could go in and out of conversation in a moment's notice because he was a terrible thinker. You know, Willie said, you need to be here in this conference and you need to think. Lincoln could never have done what he did to hold the nation together, much less transform it. In, the, in that incredible crucible and in the shock and awe of the brutality and the death of the Civil War if he did not give himself lots and lots of time to think. And it wasn't just because he didn't have a smartphone. So people always say to me, oh no, but Lincoln didn't have email, he didn't have Facebook, he didn't have text messages. Bollocks! Lincoln had more stuff coming at him than almost anyone in this room. And I don't say that presumptuously. The telegraph was as bad as email on its worst day as bad as your phone ever gets in terms of needing you and wanting to re react. He had people from all parts of the country, ordinary citizens, journalists, everyone wanted not only something from Lincoln, they wanted him to do something, they wanted to criticize him. This man sat in the perfect storm for four extraordinary years and because he didn't have Strauss or Willie or Ed or Jeff or all you folks who are in great shape, he somehow held it together without a wellness program. I'll say something more about that in a second. <laughs> I kid you not, full service education. That's what we specialize in at the Harvard Business School. So two other things to say about this portrait. Lincoln always thought of himself, and these are again sidebar. Lincoln always thought of himself as ugly. In fact, 
And he always felt very bashful, even though he's very attracted to women and a very, very robust sex drive. That's only a tiny little bit of the book. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, he and Mary had important connections, in this, and their sexual connection was in one of them. Um, and so were their kids, and so were politics. Those were the three big ties that bound them all the way through, through the first year of the war when she went off the rails with Willie's death, and he was, too, he was much too compelled by the war to, to nurse her. Um, but he always saw himself as ugly, and so, so he was shy around women. There's a wonderful moment in the debates with Stephen Douglas when he's running for U.S. Senator from Illinois in 1858 when Douglas calls him two-faced, and Lincoln says, two-faced? Do you think if I had two faces, I'd wear this one? <laughs> he was very, very funny, very, very quick and funny. The, so last point. He is uncharacteristically well-dressed because Lincoln was a completely haphazard dress, dresser and, and very disorganized. He would keep, for all you folks at Walker and Dunlop who are you know, selling money, Lincoln would keep all his invoices in his hat. And then he would lose them. Um, terribly disorganized. But he understood money and he understood power very well. But he, he was terribly haphazard dresser. He's dressed up here for this portrait, 1854 is the date. But look at his hair. Like That is not Bumble and Bumble products, right? That is just Lincoln being haphazard. If you've seen the Spielberg movie, which is terrifically true in most respects to the historical record, um, you, he talks about that at the beginning of the movie. Okay, um, so Lincoln, couple of no, notes. Couple, get, 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 get to the point, Nancy. Um, Lincoln was self-educated. So he had a year of formal, a little less than a year of formal schooling. These are some of his notebooks. The point here isn't, well, look what Lincoln did with a year of formal schooling. What does that say about all of us with degrees? It's, that's not the point. The point is that all great leaders that get better in crucibles, understand that to do that, you actually have to pull a lot of knowledge. You got, can't stroke it. This is reactive, retrospective knowledge, my friends. It's coming at you. We need some of it. We don't need as much as we're stroking for. And we're paying an opportunity cost, because when it's this uncertain and this volatile, we're not going to see things we need to see right? unless we're looking up and pulling, not just receiving, pulling. Lincoln was very good at pulling knowledge and learning. He was not an intellect. He was not a Renaissance man. He, owned, he knew Shakespeare, and he knew the King James Bible, and he read nothing else in terms of literature, nothing. Um, he learned what he needed to know on a surgical strike basis. So when he needs to study surveying to, put, to, to make a living in New Salem as a young man, he learns surveying. He pulls it. When he needs to learn military strategy in the early 1862, because his, his generals won't fight, he pulls the books from the Library of Congress, and he teaches himself military. So lesson number one from Lincoln. You're in this kind of turbulence, which is not going to abate but only intensify, we're all going to have to be own more responsibility for educating ourselves and pulling knowledge and then transforming that knowledge into understanding. So first lesson from Mr. Lincoln. He was very good at that, and he, and he got better and better. Uh, now, law office. So this is so Lincoln, I'm, I'm skipping on to his early legal career. So Lincoln, born in Kentucky, ends up working in a place called New Salem for nine years after he's 21. Very interesting part of his life that's not well studied. It's good in my book, so you can read that, that chapter, um, and including the romantic interest there and all kinds of juicy stuff. Um, but here's his law office, where he, where he ends up in 1839 in Springfield with three, for the first of three law partners, the first two of whom were mentors to him. They were senior. They knew a lot more than he. They taught him to stop being such a narcissistic jerk in the courtroom. Lincoln was started off as a lazy and disorganized lawyer who would cram right before the trial like lots of us did in college, and then go in and try and win the case by hectoring, criticizing, lambasting, making fun of his opponent without a great deal of knowledge about the case. And he, would, he had a great, great, great gift for public speaking, which he kept improving all his life. And he would just kind of take that out into sixth gear and say, I'm going to win the case. And of course, he didn't. And it takes, Lincoln was a good listener. He, learned, he always was, wanted to improve. So when these two senior partners, two years with each, work with him to kind of teach him how important knowing the fundamentals of the case are and how it's not, it's not primarily about show in the courtroom, although your know, presentation matters, Lincoln becomes a very, very skilled lawyer. And, but, and, and I want to tell you the second lesson is from his legal work. By the way, this was his law office. It was so disorganized in his time, much messier than this, that there was a pile of papers right here about a foot and a half high with a little note on it that said, and a rock on top that said, if you can't find it anywhere else, look for it here. <laughs> Again, this is not your lean, mean chief executive. So what Lincoln learned as a lawyer, and this he ultimately gave a great law a lecture to a bunch of people studying for the bar in the 1850s, so we have good records on this. He said, what I learned 
was that the essence of a case, the essence of any single major issue, always came down to one, two, or three things. And if I could sway the jury to the one, two, or three things on which the case hung, I could give everything else away in the course of the trial. Give it away, and then I could win the case. Now just think about that for a second. What's he saying? He's saying two things. First, a lot of the stuff that we're dealing with is a lot less important than the one, two, or three things that are really at the center of the big issues that you, the leaders, and only you can deal with. So the first thing he's saying is about focus. What are the one, two, or three things that only you can do every day, or only you can do this week? And, and, and by the way, what's the opportunity cost of not doing those? So saying no to all the other stuff is actually saying yes, Lincoln's saying, saying yes to the one, two, or three things that matter. Of all the things that worry me as a student, serious student of leadership now, biographer of leaders, the thing that worries me most is that we can't stay focused on the really important stuff. There's too much other stuff competing for our attention. Lincoln's saying pick the one, two, or three things, give it all, second, give the rest away or let it go. And if you're doing that with an opponent, as he was in the courtroom, you disarm your opponent. He's such a canny, calculating man, this Mr. Lincoln. So second lesson, focus on the one, two, or three things, give the rest away. So Lincoln's legal work is a really interesting piece of his making. Again, it's covered in the book. Lincoln loses three races between 1849, when he comes back from a two-year stint in Congress, and the presidential election. He is despondent. As you, many of you know, Lincoln suffered from what today we call chronic depression, there's no question he would have been you know, medicated on, a, on a, good, uh, a good antidepressant, and that would have changed his life. But as it was, he, he suffered from a great deal of depression, and he gets very, very depressed during, as president, very depressed in the wake of his political losses in the 1850s. He called it, by the way, the hypo, and doctors bled him with leeches and, and whatnot, but the, not, not, none of which made a huge difference to his state. He did say, at no, a number of points in his life, I will never carry a pocket knife because I get so dark and despondent about myself, I would be scared of what would happen. So, so this is a man who's dealing with the, you know, the valleys of, of serious depression and self-doubt, um, and who, by the way, I think, moment by moment, and this is important for all of us in the room, every time he came out of a valley, that valley, that experience, became another layer of resilience, another layer of muscle in his resilience core that he could flex which is such an important part of the making of leaders, this iterative layering on of our resilience. In 1860, God punishes you when he, want, when he, when he, when, you know, when, when he answers your prayers. Lincoln is elected president, right? Always wanted to hunt national office. He's pre elected president in a, in a four-man race in 1860, and the country splits apart, and the Civil War begins. Lesson number four from Mr. Lincoln. So the Civil War is... I don't, I don't want to say very much about the war. There's a lot about it in the book and his leadership of his generals, his leadership of the Congress, his leadership of the country. I, I, I paint Lincoln as a change leader who not only had to you know, execute the change, but had to communicate and hold the nation together, the North together, while he did that. So it's the, the frame on Lincoln as, and as president is the frame on someone managing great change, for those of you that are interested. This is Lincoln's cabinet in a famous painting by a guy named Francis Carpenter. This is lesson number four. Lincoln chose, as Doris Kearns Goodwin has written about in her book that was the basis of the Spielberg movie, Team of Rivals, intentionally chose a group of men that were more skilled, more connected, more experienced, higher in stature, and believed themselves to be infinitely more competent than he, and he knew that. So lesson number four is the sense of deep humility that is possible when we really believe in our mission and in our, in our dedication, be in the game, our dedication to get in the game and embrace the cause. Lincoln was not a humble person. He accessed great, he, he became a person deeply committed to what he could do as president. He was not humble. He accessed humility in very important ways, and he did this very, very strategically. He needed stuff that Bill William Seward knew. He needed Edwin Stanton's experience running the War Department. He needed Montgomery Blair as Postmaster General. He needed this team of rivals. 
and he had to co pull them into a coherent group where the whole was greater than the sum of the parts. It's a huge testimony to his emotional awareness and his ability to access his humility that from the deepest sense of dedication to his mission, he could keep this team together and forge them into a great, into a very, very effective cabinet. Okay, I'm gonna end with, and then we'll leave a couple of minutes for questions. I'm gonna end with Gettysburg. Um, all of you know it was a pivotal battle, probably the most, single most important battle of the war, July 1st through 3rd, 1863, south, southern Pennsylvania, 150,000 troops, approximately 55,000 from the Confederacy, 58,000, uh, uh, 98,000 on the part of the North, march into this little hamlet, 50,000 are killed or wounded in three days of fighting. Let me just say that again, 50,000 are killed or wounded in three days of fighting. So these are just a few photographs. I want to say two things about Gettysburg. This is Lincoln coming down from the Gettysburg Address. We have no pictures of Lincoln giving the Gettysburg Address. Why is that? Because the Gettysburg Address is less than 300 words long. It took Lincoln less than three minutes to give. The photographer was still setting up his tripod when Lincoln stepped down. And that's why all we have is Lincoln at number two stepping down and Ward Lamont, his bodyguard, at number one. So no pictures. Now, what's the Gettysburg Address? Let's go back to Willie Slots. The Gettysburg dress is the course we're on. It's a freight, not just, the, not just what we're doing here and where we're headed in the Civil War, this terrible Civil War, right? All these living and dead who bravely struggled here. The Gettysburg Address is also an, a very serious attempt to frame that stake, the stakes of that course, right? Here we are engaged in a great Civil War, testing whether that nation, a nation, by the way, that started off four score and seven years ago, founded on the principle that all men are created equal. So here we are, here's our buttress, here's our foundation, here's the moment we're engaged in, here's where we're headed. Here's what happened at this field. Here are the costs of being engaged in that course, right? The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, who struggled, have consecrated far beyond our power to, poor power to add or detract. It is also, in the third paragraph, a call to action for all of us, we the living, right? Be here dedicated to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that this nation shall not have died in vain, the government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. So what's Lincoln doing? Just taking a page out of Willie's playbook saying, I gotta tell people what we're doing, why we're doing it, how it's related to who we are, and what our purpose is, our differentiation is, and what each of our roles is standing here at this moment of dedicating the cemetery. It is for us, the living, to carry on knowing the cost and knowing the mission, knowing that the cause, the end, justifies these terrible costs, but not minimizing those costs. Here are the trade-offs, and here is why we keep marching. I tell you, my friends, my fellow citizens, this is getting so, the ability to communicate where we're going to our people, to tell them and help them understand their role, their significance, the mission we're on and why the trade-offs are worth making is getting more important every hour because we're just, there's so much noise around us, there's so much confusion. Lincoln was a, became a, made himself into a brilliant communicator, able to frame the stakes and the mission and our part in that march. So that's the first thing I want to say. Last thing I want to say about the Gettysburg is a tiny, very powerful story. And I'm going to be over. I've got some slides of lessons, but we'll open up for questions and we can pass we can get we can get those distributed to you. I got tenure at Harvard Business School at 2001 and I stopped learning about the Celtics and I stopped learning about the Patriots and I gave up PowerPoints. So you'll forgive me. Um, <laughs> After Gettysburg, so before the speech, after the battle, it was liberating. After the battle, uh, the, 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 the commanding Union officers, a guy named George Meade, Grant and Sherman hadn't really yet emerged out of the West to become, to become known to Lincoln as the commanders he needed. So they haven't yet emerged into the top of the army, the Federal Army. George Meade elects on July 3rd, the last day of the battle, disastrous pickets charge, described in the book, Lee, Lee's men limping home, right away they turn, they turn for home, 
The, the Confederate wagon, medical wagon train stretches 17 miles. A lot of people, they're carrying home a lot of people. They leave thousands of Confederate soldiers for Gettysburg women to nurse, and they do for months. But Meade elects in that moment, in the hours after the battle's over, about 3 o'clock, not to pursue uh, Lee going home. Meade makes calculates, calculated risks. So what Ed was talking about, my men are too tired. We cannot have another battle. We had won it in the end by a, mass mis a massive miscalculation by Robert E. Lee, but we, they were exhausted. Everything else had been a hair's breadth for three days. So Lee decides, Meade decides not to fight. Meade sends a telegraph to Lincoln. Informing of that, Lincoln gets the telegraph early in the morning on July 5th, and he's livid. He can't hardly contain himself. I can see him pacing, like just pacing through his office in the center of the White House. Executive wing doesn't come until Teddy Roosevelt. He's pacing. He's furious. He stands at his writing desk. Lincoln wrote all his own stuff. And he starts writing this letter. And he starts off graciously, Mr. Lee, congratulations. And then he gets going, like we get going on the emails or the text. He gets going, you have no idea how much you've disappointed me. Do you have any idea how many countless men will now die because of your unwillingness to, to fight Robert E. Lee and your cowardice? I am immeasurably distressed with you. And it's three pages. I mean, he's got a head of steam. And then, I can picture him, he folds it up, puts it in an envelope, seals it, and puts it in his desk where it's found after he died. To George Meade, July 5th, 1863, never signed, never sent. So I, I thought to myself many, many times, why didn't he send the letter? I know, we can all, we can all ascertain pretty easily why he didn't send the letter. He didn't send the letter because he didn't have many more fighting generals left. He'd been through a whole bunch of generals that wouldn't fight. Meade had just won a big battle. The West Point brass thought Lincoln was an idiot who wanted to fight an unwinnable war. He didn't have anyone in the ranks. He didn't have anyone on deck. So if he'd sent that letter with all that vitriol, all that reactive emotion, which we can all understand, the course of history might have been different. So I always say to people like you, what if Lincoln had had email? Oh, no, that's a, that's a titter. But there's something really profound in there. Right. So the hotter. We are under the collar. The higher the stakes, the more the volatility swirling around us, the bigger the opportunity that may be in that volatility or the, or the rival or the threat, the more it actually is actually about doing nothing in the heat of the moment. What if doing nothing is the most powerful something that great leaders do in certain moments? Like John Kennedy in the Cuban Missile Crisis responding to Khrushchev's second angry letter on day 10. The response is all you know was he didn't respond. He ignored it. So I'm going to leave you there. Got a couple of slides about these lessons, summarizing these lessons, and a few more. We'll get you to pass them out because we've got about 10 minutes for questions, if there are questions. Oh, wait, no, wait, I'm sorry. Wellness. We have to do wellness. Sorry. This is Lincoln in 1860 when he won the Republican nomination, spring. This is Lincoln right after the Gettysburg Address, November 1863. And this is Lincoln about a month before he was assassinated. He lost 25 pounds. He weighed 155 pounds on a six foot four frame when he died. He didn't sleep and he didn't eat. And we are lucky, let's go back to the things that you're talking about and working on physically at this conference. We are lucky that he was physically so strong from all those years on the frontier, because he did not have Strauss. And he did not have yoga, and he did not have a tempur mattress, and he did not have a lot of hydration. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm being a little bit funny on purpose, but the point is, your mortal coil and feeding and watering you is the single most important thing you can do. And we are lucky that Abraham Lincoln was physically strong. The whole self is what leaders have to access, and that means your physical energy is really important. I'm sorry. I, I promised I didn't want not to deliver. There's a question over here. Hey, Nancy. Uh, great, great job. I wish you were teaching when I was at HBS. Is that Jeff? Yeah, I'm here, back here. Yeah. So the question Dan's I have. Dan, glad to see you. <laughs> <laughs> OK. The, the question I have is, you know, over the last couple decades, and maybe it's just because I'm old, we seem to be going through this technology revolution. And it's harder and harder to get people's attention. Have you looked at the leadership effect of technology and? And I think you've mentioned it a couple times, you know, people not 
So that's the crux of my Got take it. it from there. Yeah, so yes, I have quite a bit of work. Not, there's a couple of people at the business school that have done more work than I. Leslie Perlow is a good person, P-E-R-L-O-W. But I've done a fair amount of work um, as well. You're absolutely right. Uh, it turns out that people actually, it's, it's harder to get people's attention, but if you have something real and serious and worthy to say, people are really interested in what you have to say because guess what, we all have these Geiger counters in our heads that are scrolling, scrolling, scrolling and, and going, this isn't really important, this isn't really interesting, this is really junk, this is kind of salacious. Ooh, I can't believe I'm actually following this dirty kind of slimy stuff. <laughs> so, so worthiness, we know, Serious, seriousness, worthiness, and, and an emotional connection continue to be really important magnets, particularly the emotional connection, Jeff, because if you look at the research about people that spend extraordinary amounts on the internet and whatever mobile device they're, uh, device they're using, the, the, the disconnect and the sense of depression or self-doubting or, or, or lower expectations rises dramatically. There's a huge correlation between after a certain number of hours on the internet weekly and, and, and any kind of signs of what we call depression. So the ability to emotionally connect to people in a way that people can feel is worthy is, our, is, is leaders' most strong, most important tool in, in, in grabbing people's energy and attention and investment. Again, that means we gotta, we gotta, we can't be just here. Nancy, uh, Winston Churchill was very, very powerful in World War II, but was later defeated. What would have happened, in your opinion, with Abraham Lincoln had he not been assassinated? I think we have, things would have been very, I just finished Ron Chernow's grant, for those of you that are looking for some good weight training. Uh, it's 1,400 pages. It's a, re I, it's, it's a very, very good book. Um, a huge piece of it is about Andrew Johnson's presidency, when, right, the vice president who became president when Lincoln was assassinated, and all the different turbulent forces that were, were not managed or led through and, and, the, and the extraordinary volatility the country found itself in instead of a kind of you know, reunification that might have seen some of this difficulty through. So, so I, I feel very confident in saying that Lincoln would have been a very, very different president than Andrew Johnson, and that f at least three things would have been very different. First, Lincoln was working quite seriously from about August of 1864, when it became clear that the U Sherman took Atlanta and the Union would win, likely win, had been working on a very serious reconstruction plan. He'd been thinking about it for a long time. Remember Willie said, we can't just be managing for today in a reactive way. We have to be thinking about tomorrow. Lincoln was thinking about it. How are we going to bring two different sets of Southerners into the un back into the Union? We've got to bring African Americans, who are now going to be citizens, Negroes, as we call them, that have been colored people, Lincoln's term, into the Union. And so he, he, had, he, had, he had piloted and begun establishing, and it did, this did happen, a department in the United States executive branch that would educate black Americans that had been slaves and, find, and begin to find employment for them. So that was the first thing. Second thing, we're going to have to bring all these Southerners who have been depending on slave labor to run agricultural enterprises or blacksmith shops. We're going to have to bring them into the union. And he was starting to think about how they were going to do that with, again, a very serious government strategy to do that. And then third, and we see a bit of this. This is really important. Back to compassion. Lincoln, like, Ma Lincoln, like Mandela, was going to bring the South into, back into the into the fold on extremely lenient and compassionate terms with malice toward none. He meant it with charity toward all. He sent Grant down to Appomattox saying, I want you to be as lenient as you possibly can. They keep their arms, they keep their horses. As long as they don't make war in the United States, we want them to go back and become citizens again of our country. So it was Lincoln's ability to rise above the bitterness that was in himself too and offer with, mal with charity toward all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right. Let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and his widow, and his orphan, to do all we can to achieve a just and lasting peace among ourselves and all nations. That's where he was headed. That would have been the most important gas Yarn he had to weave the country back together, it would have been a ma major difference. The course of history would have been different. I think about it all the time. All the time. The guard who went to get the drink at Ford's Theater outside the door of the presidential. Yep. Hi. 
Nancy, uh, thank you for your comments. On the Shackleton story, when in the diaries, was there any talk from either him or his men on his decision to leave to go back to <laughs> affect the rescue? And how do you kind of tie that into leadership? To go back what? When, when, when Shackleton left the island and left 22 men, was oh. there any talk in their diaries of yeah. you trusting so, him or not trusting him to come absolutely. back? Absolutely. So, so, yes, there is. So the first thing he did, you should know, I didn't say this, was to write out like a, an articles of governance that he gave to Frank Wilde, based his, the, his, second, his first mate who he left in command, saying, I give you all authority, right? If we don't return home, tell, tell my people I tried to save my men and I did this for the United Kingdom. So, um, so he, he passes the authority to Frank Wilde. Frank Wilde, who, who had been with Shackleton on that, that second expedition where they turned back, right, and trusted Shackleton with his life, believed stalwartly that Shackleton would come back. But as month became month, April, he left, they left in April. April, May, June, July, August. It's August 31st when the Yelko comes to get them. Wilde begins to think they've died. And so Wilde begins planning an expedition um, of his own, re rehabilitating one of the lifeboats and trying to sail north. That doesn't happen because Shackleton comes before then. But what the diaries say is, every single morning, Frank Wilde said, men, let's get up, clean up the camp. The boss may come get us each day. He may come get us today, every single morning. So we know he kept a lot of cohesion. We know by, the, by August, they were, they, were eating, they were making barnacle soup. The men were very worried because they were running out of food, and the, the seals and penguins had vanished. Um, and we know that Frank Wilde, every single morning, tried to hold them together around Shackleton. So he clearly believed that Shackleton was a unifying force. There were no incidents, even though, they had, even though the, there had been some, some issues with the, the, the broader team when Shackleton was there. There were no incidents. And the worst medical uh, uh, accident was Someone got gangrene in their big toe and it had to be amputated. So it was an astounding feat of leadership and team management on the part of Wilde while Shackleton was gone. A lot of it done in Shackleton's name, intentionally by Wilde. Let me, let me, let me just pause here and I'll just show a couple. I want to see the last slide of slides. So these are lessons. We've talked about this. Let me get to the last one. Um, we've talked about this. Here we go. So. It's the last two I want to, the last one I really want to talk about because I've mentioned all these other things. Real leadership, real leaders lead from their humanity. This is to your question about communication, Jeff. Building trust by constant communication, re consistent empathy, and regular attention to the, to the stakes involved. So here's where I want to stop, and then uh, I know you've got all kinds of really interesting stuff coming up. Um, People's faith in public, at least political leaders, is very, very low. It's, it was low after the 2008 financial crisis. It kind of bumped along the bottom for a few years. This is, I'm looking at Edelman numbers and other no, related numbers. And then it kind of, kind of, in a very, you know, kind of limped up a little bit, you know, just a little bit. And now it's low again. It's very, very low. And this isn't a partisan comment. It's not a comment about the president or the Congress, red or blue. It's a comment about, from a leadership expert. It's very, very low, and it's not. I don't. I don't. I don't really think the midterms, whatever happens. I wish I could be here to hear um, our, the expert from the University of Virginia, whose name I've just forgotten. Bill. Larry Sabato. Larry Sabato. Good name. Um, I wish I could be here for that, but 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 I think no matter what happens with the midterms, we're not going to see you know a, a hawk-like rise in public trust. Here's the point: people are actually still looking for leaders, my friends. They haven't given up on leadership. Um, first point, they haven't given up on leadership. They're actually looking in all kinds of new places and, and other places for leadership. So, and, and the, a lot of the people that work with you are, have always looked to you. They're actually looking harder to you now. That's my point. Because as other former repositories of who will guide us, who will inspire us, who will help us develop resilience, who will call forth our better selves. As some of those more traditional sources of inspiration and guidance fall in our eyes or are diminished in our eyes, we still have a very deep, very inherent longing for those individuals in our life. So I'm telling you two things. First, the world has never needed you to be at your best and getting better, at your best and getting better. Because all the physical athletes know you never 
There's always the next wall to break through. So it is with leaders. So the first thing is the world has never needed you more than it needs you now, and particularly the people right around you. And that's not just your, your employees, or your partners, your teams, it's your families, your communities, your neighbors, the folks you coach on your kids' teams. It's the whole enchilada. So that's the first thing. And the second thing to say is that one of the things that our gadgets are doing to us, this gets back to Jeff's question and Willie saying, turn the PDA, put the PDAs away, they're actually dialing down a lot of our sense of how to connect with other people. You know, I went to a Thanksgiving dinner last year. My sister's, my sister's daughter was at one end of the table. She's 17. She was shooting pictures of the turkey to her friend that was sitting at this end of the table. <laughs> right? And they were having a whole like picture Instagram thing going on about dinner. This is not going to see us through turbulence or help us create, <laughs> move good, the boulder of goodness forward or become better versions of ourselves or help our young people develop into, you know, into people they respect on journeys they want to travel. So the ability in ourselves to emotionally, to harness our emotional awareness and then use it with the best of our humanity in a thoughtful, intentional way, because our machines are making us less intentional on this stuff. We have to now be purposeful about it, has never been more pressing. And the rewards from that have never been greater. So let me stop there and say it's been a real privilege and a pleasure. I sure as hell wish I was staying longer. Thank you. Thank you.